Hi everyone, it's James here. Welcome to another video. So today is going to be a sort of follow-up to a video I did a couple of weeks ago and um, the video was all about albums that I was fairly certain I would never buy and I picked five albums and talked about them and um, got a lot of good responses to that video. Thanks for everybody who, who chimed in on that one and uh, it was good that uh, I didn't, uh, well, it seemed like I hadn't offended anybody. Now there was one comment uh, which um, gave me an idea for a follow-on video and that comment came from John Downing, Six Inch Pianist 319, who um, he was talking about the album Nevermind by Nirvana, which was one of the five albums that I'd said in the video that I probably would never get. Um, now John, John's little story with that record apparently is that um, he said it kind of acted as a kind of wipe the slate clean kind of record for him or a kind of musical reboot. He said at the time he'd be, uh, he was listening to a lot of, I think he described it as, as maybe um, 80s rock or kind of late 80s, early 90s rock and um, Nirvana came along. I, mean, I would imagine this would be true for quite a few people actually. I mean the whole point of that record in a way was to try and sweep the board clean you know, wipe away some of the more kind of perhaps corporate manifestations of rock music that were around at the time, introduce a more, um, you know, authentic kind of punk sound. This, you know, the Seattle scene was a, a grassroots movement, I guess, and that's why that record had the huge impact that it did. Now, a couple of other people responded to John in the comments and they were saying, and we were all sort of agreeing that it would be good to do a follow-on video called, you know, is there a wipe the slate clean album in your life or in my life, in your life? And um, my immediate response to it was to think, I'm not entirely sure there is one, this concept of wiping the slate clean. Now, I don't think in John's case he literally meant it wiped the slate clean altogether, so he never went back and listened to any of the previous music again. It was more just a kind of musical reboot or something which sent him off into a new direction. In his case, it wasn't necessarily in the direction of Seattle rock. He said it actually sent him off in the direction of soul music, which is really interesting. So you can get an album which somehow reboots you or resets your musical clock but you don't then necessarily pursue other records that sound like that one it's just that that record has such a powerful effect on you that it something in your musical brain changes and you see things in a new light or it gives you maybe a broader perspective on music you're almost instinctively drawn then towards exploring other stuff so I was racking my brains thinking there must be something I can talk about, there must be a record I can talk about. And in the end I came up with this one. Um, this is Forever Changes by Love. Now, um, when I first heard the album it was on this um, CD and I can still remember buying it. This came from Phase One Records in Wrexham, a shop which is long gone. And I wish I could date when I bought it. I'm going to guess it was probably in about 1993, maybe 1994. And this was a result really, probably of reading music magazines, which I was doing fairly avidly by this point. Um, and it was a sort of, it was a, a whole little group of records. And really it was the usual suspect, you know, these ones that you start to tap into when you start to read music magazines and you start to read these lists of the greatest albums of all time, you know. So there were things like Pet Sounds and, um, you know, various albums like that, those big albums. This one probably was on a list somewhere. I probably just, you know, saw it on the racks and kind of went, oh, right, that's one of those records that they keep talking about in these magazines, so I'll buy it. Now, when I discovered the vinyl community, which is about six years ago, and I saw people like Ron Beaudry on the VC showing all these lovely reissues, you know, nice reissued records. At, at that point, I don't think I properly even clocked the fact that there were all these great albums um, that had long been unavailable on, on vinyl, which I had in my collection on CD, were starting to come out as these lovely vinyl reissues. I don't think I'd properly realised that. So when I did realise that, when I saw that the you know these records were now back on sale again on vinyl, I started to drop lists of albums which I would like to get hold of. And the first two that I got, the first one I got, was News of the World by Queen. And I think the, the reason I got that one was that that was pretty much the first rock album I ever had. You know, it came out in 1977. I think I had it in the summer of 1978 when I was only, you know, seven years old. But it was the first proper rock album I think I'd ever owned. Clearly a hugely significant one for me. So that was the very first one I got when I decided to, you know, go down this, explore this new avenue of, buy, of um, buying vinyl reissues. And the second one I got, and the, and the one that came through the door maybe a couple of weeks later, was this one, Love. Forever Changes. Um, it's a white vinyl edition 
And so I was thinking, well, that must have meant something. Why did I choose Forever Changes as the second vinyl reissue to get? And so I started thinking back through this and um, I think this record was important in the sense that I think it was the first record I can remember listening to and really like, not knowing what to make of it. I think up until that point, my musical tastes had always, they seemed to have always sort of fallen into my lap a little bit. Most of the music I was into were things that would grab me on top of the pops. I'd see something, you know, whatever, Squeeze, The Motors, Paul McCartney. I'd see something, I'd love it, and then I'd want the record, and I'd get the record, and I'd love the record immediately. And it was a kind of instant thing, almost like a spoon-to-mouth kind of effect. That had kind of informed my musical buying, you know, over a period of quite a few years, really. Um, now, when I got to about the age of 15, 16, I got into hard rock and a bit of heavy metal, and... Um, I think that was partly as a result of kind of not peer pressure exactly, but maybe the urge to conform with a peer group or something. I mean, that is the definition of peer pressure, isn't it? But I think certainly with bands like ACDC and that kind of thing and the Scorpions and a little bit later, David Lee Roth, it was as a result of being in certain friendship circles where people were into that kind of music. Um, I did like the music. It's not that I was just, you know, blindly following the herd, but um, I think that's probably why I got so into that for a few years. And um, I started reading Kerrang! magazine and all that kind of thing. Now, when I went to university in 89, it was quite interesting because I'd stopped listening to heavy rock and metal at that point, but I was still listening to, uh, sorry, I was still reading Kerrang! magazine. I carried on reading Kerrang! for at least a year after I'd stopped listening to that music or buying it. Um, and one of the big records that happened that I discovered round about that time and I was kind of 18, 19 was Sgt Pepper, which interestingly I'd never listened to back in the day. I'd loved the Beatles when I was a kid, but I, that's not a record that I'd ever explored. So Sgt Pepper was, was a big one. Um, I got that from the Beatles shop in Liverpool on CD and in my first year at uni I listened to that and Abbey Road, you know, constantly. And I guess those two records they were real sort of wipe the slate clean albums in a way. You know, when you first get a glimpse of the historic nature of it all, the fact there was this continuum of popular music and, you know, the Beatles, those big albums of the mid-1960s, they were such, you know, game changers. I think I heard, you know, Pet Sounds at about the same time and started to awaken to this idea that music is not just a kind of, just a thing that you encounter in the spur of the moment and get into it's something which you can actually approach almost like a scholarly pursuit in a way you know not to be too boring about it but it was something which could be explored and you could get into it in a kind of adult way with a certain degree of perspective it wasn't just a sort of a, a kind of consumerist activity so <clears throat> but the thing about Sgt Pepper and Abbey Road is that I've been listening to the Beatles since I was um, about five years old really you know so it, that was nothing new to me it was the experience of getting into those records as historic items was a, a kind of novel experience and starting to piece together the jigsaw of popular music and seeing how it all fitted together. That was definitely new. But the, but the music itself was, was really nothing new to me. This, I think, I think even Pet Sounds actually, I did find Pet Sounds to be a little bit challenging, but I could still kind of hear that it was recognisably pop music the sort of, you know, tuneful chart fare that I'd always known. I mean, clearly the album does, you know, voyage off into certain kind of areas which are not just commercial pop music, but the Beach Boys, it was still recognisable to me. This was the first sort of true enigma, really. I can still remember going home and listening to it. I was at my parents' house at the time. I wasn't actually in my own house over in Leeds. I'd gone to visit my parents, so I bought this from Wrexham. And I went home and listened to it in my childhood bedroom on a CD player, and I just really did not know what to make of it at all. Um, I wasn't sure if I liked it or not. The songs were really... They were very, very different to anything I'd heard before. I think the main thing about them was that they didn't really have any hooks. That was the thing that really puzzled me about it. You know, the Beatles and all the music that I'd been into inspired by the Beatles... It was essentially, it was hook-based music. It was music that was based around the idea of a catchy refrain or a chorus or something which would come in again and grab you and you'd get to know the song. This was different. The songs were kind of mysterious. They were tuneful, but the tunes were really unpredictable. They were kind of, um, they didn't sound like, it didn't sound like music that was designed to get on the radio at all. The lyrics were dark. I mean, it's an absolutely fascinating album to, you know, get into the history of. 
Arthur Lee and um, who was the other guy? Brian McLean, I think it was, the other guy in the band. McLean. They kind of wrote it between them. Well, Brian McLean wrote two songs, Alone Again and Old Man, and um, Arthur Lee wrote all the rest. And um, they, I think they wrote the album or recorded the album in a crumbling old mansion somewhere in California. It was called The Castle, I think. And um, it was really, I suppose, it was really their reaction to, or their natural cynicism towards the flower power movement and the counterculture. Um, they were not entirely sold on it. Um, this was in 1967. There was a certain amount of disillusionment creeping through on the scene. I mean, George Harrison was really disillusioned with the, the flower power movement almost as soon as he saw it in action. You know, he went to um, Haight-Asbury in the summer of 67, I think, and just described it as a load of you know, awful hippie dropouts, basically, just, uh, and I think, I think Love came from the same place, this was their third album, and I think um, it was an attempt to cast a kind of uh, very jaded eye over what was going on at the time. So you've got these incredibly dark lyrics, I mean, I wrote a few down here, you know, the track The Red Telephone, sitting on a hillside, watching all the people die, and then this wonderful line, sometimes my life is so eerie, what a line. It reminds me almost of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, you know, um, nausea. That sort of existentialist early 20th century thing where you suddenly look around you and you realise your life is really strange and you don't really feel at home in your body or in the environment that you're existing in and your life all of a sudden seems so strange, seems so eerie. Fantastic. And then he goes, they're locking them up today, they're throwing away the key. I wonder who it'll be tomorrow, you or me. It taps right into that kind of Charles Manson, White Album, just that whole era of, you know, Vietnam going on and just dark, dark stuff. The Stones at Altamont and all that, you know, it's the sort of dark side of the 60s. I mean, I knew nothing about that when I first heard this record. I mean, I'd heard Sergeant Pepper at that point, which it is obviously it's this. Well, I say it's Sergeant Pepper does have some kind of dark undertones to it, but you have to kind of listen very carefully to hear them. Um, whereas this record it sort of wears its darkness on its sleeve really and um, it's not really a pop album at all. A house is not a motel. By the time that I'm through singing the bells from the schools will be ringing. More confusions, blood transfusions, the news today will be the movies for tomorrow and the waters turn to blood and if you don't think so go turn on your tub. It's almost like a kind of Stanley Kubrick. Um, it's just full of dread you know, it's just a sense of real dread, fear, paranoia. But the music's quite beautiful. When you first start to tap into the beauty of the music, because it's not, it's not hook-based, so you don't get these catchy refrains, but what you do get is a lot of compositional um, sophistication, I suppose. You know, the, the tunes and the melodies, they creep up on you, and the harmonies are really kind of interesting. There's a sort of, I think he's, um, Arthur Lee has got his own little twist on Brian Wilson's sense of harmonies really where you don't necessarily opt for the most obvious harmony you opt for something slightly not what you'd expect to hear a strange combination of chords under a certain melody you've got that going on and you've got the kind of orchestrations all this kind of baroque instrumentation you know classical instrumentation a bit of folk music coming through a lot of guitar acoustic guitar stuff coming through and spanish guitar things that sound very ancient and old you know things that you you get the sense that they're tapping back into really old forms of music, but really suggesting it on a subtle level. They're not trying to be um, arty or anything. It's just, it's coming through quite organically in the songwriting. And um, I think up until this point, most of the music I listened to, I could kind of hear that, yeah, if you sort of, if you plunked away on a piano for a while, you might be able to come up with something that sounded like this song or that song. But with this music, it was totally... Um, it was totally original. It was totally different. I couldn't, I couldn't see where or how he'd arrived at it. I had no um, fixed bearings at all. I was just completely at sea with it. Didn't really understand it. So um, I guess that's the reason I would nominate it as the record which kind of rewired me or which reset my brain. Didn't wipe the slate clean, uh, but it did. It did set me on a new path, I think, and uh, made me realise that there was more to music more to enjoying music than just sort of almost passively accepting what's put in front of you or there was more to music than just following the same path all the time and just you know going down this path which I I kind of done that you know I, I'd been into the Beatles 
and then there were things that flowed on from that, Wings being the most obvious one, but all those bands, you know, in the 1970s, ELO, Pink Floyd, there were lots of groups like that that were sort of, they were really neatly coming out of that tradition. And this record, you know, amongst others, there were a few others at the time, but I think this is the first one probably where I got that sense of the uncanny or that sense of something being um, different and challenging and something that was going to... Um, you know, change my perspective. So I suspect, like I said before, when I joined the VC and I, did, I thought to myself, right, I'll start to buy some reissues, it's quite interesting that the first one was Queen News of the World and the second one was Love Forever Changes, but um, I'll go with that as being the closest I can get to to um, a record that wiped the slate clean or certainly rebooted me on some level. Uh, so hope you enjoyed the video do leave some comments below and if you'd like to jump on this thread and discuss music or records which um, sent you off on a, a radical new direction i'd love to hear about that take care folks thanks for watching and i'll see you soon